You're listening to the Yoga Medicine Podcast. I'm your host, Rachel Land. This podcast brings you information and resources to enhance the therapeutic effects of your practice based on a deeper understanding of anatomy, physiology, and the integration of modern science and research with traditional practices and experiences. Join me and my co-hosts, Tiffany Cruikshank and Katya Bach as we dive into all things yoga, research, and wellness. Hi, Alice. Welcome back to the Yoga Medicine Podcast. Thanks for making time for us again. Hi, Rachel. Thank you for inviting me on again. It's so good to see you. It's nice to have the excuse for a chat, but this one, our last conversation related a bit more to your personal experience, and this one relates a bit more to your professional experience because it's end of summer in the Northern Northern Hemisphere. It's back to school time, and even though I don't have kids, I do remember being a kid and I know that that can be a pretty huge adjustment for kids and families. And I know the kinds of yoga practices I would call on now as an adult. I guess you have to make them a little bit more enticing or a little bit more exciting to make them appealing to kids. And that is why you're here to tell us how to do that. That's exactly it. Yeah, this is the right time of year. Certainly, um, the kids who I work with, the family, family, my own nieces and nephews as well mm. at this time of year, everyone is becoming, yeah, they've got the sort of Sunday blues to a big extent. <laughs> they have school looming and all the anxieties come up in terms of, um, you know, everything that comes with being at school. How will I learn? Will I make friends? Everything about it. And so... Yeah, it's a good opportunity now as we come to the end of the school holidays to get the children, get the ch- teenagers just warming up their brains mm. um, so then they need to start back at school again in September. And that was kind of the context that I started thinking about it to begin with, more the kind of warming up the brain and kind of reminding your concentration and focus muscles how to do their jobs they're kind of you know ramping your training back up again for the sustained concentration required by school that was kind of where my head went first so maybe we start there because I know you have some fun techniques to share to improve just kind of focus and concentration and memory yeah okay well we'll get started with the ones um for the the concentration and the focus cool. um, because these are creative activities they're not necessarily classed as yoga but they certainly are helpful for building up concentration and in turn that could help with yoga as well mm-hmm. um and so i'm the ones that i've chosen are for the for younger children to begin with so the first one is called what's on the tray and i would do this for children between four years old up to really 11 years old but it's going to be mm-hmm. depending on the maturity of the of the children mm-hmm. you could do it with younger children you could do it with older children as well and, I, and, and this, having had a quick look at it I already know that I would probably do poorly as a 47 year old so we can always improve our concentration and our memory <laughs> um, and so this is a um a simple activity that um that I like to do actually with the kids in the school that I work with, but I've done it with um, family as well. And you just basically have a tray and you're going to be having a selection of items on the tray. And it can be anything from um, a flower, it could be a piece of jewellery, it could be a cooking item, whatever it is, a bunch of items on the tray, and you're going to have fewer items on the tray for the younger children, and then more items on the tray for for older children. And the idea is that um, the children, participants, look at the tray for about 30 seconds, maybe a slightly longer for the younger kids, examine and memorize all the items that they can see. And then the tray is then covered, the children, the participants close their eyes and one item is taken away. And then you um, show the items again and the children need to work out which item is missing. So it's um, maybe a familiar game. I know it's one that I used to do when um, at sort of parties when, when I was little, 
um, back in the day before we had all the sort of technology that we do now. <laughs> before devices. Um, but it's good. It's a good one. Um, it's great for building com- concentration, mm. focus. It's good for memory retention. Mm. Um, it's also really helpful for children to um, have the conversation around getting things wrong, mm-hmm. not getting things right, um, in a fun way that doesn't really matter mm. and that they can try again and it's okay to get things wrong. Um, this idea of taking turns, basic things that you assume children just are able to do and then they get back to school after the hot school holidays and they don't know how to take turns, they don't know how to share, all of these oh things goodness. are yes. going to be really helpful. Um, and, it, and it's also just a little bit of fun, um, a fun way of just practising that mental concentration that can be lost over yeah. the summer holidays. Yeah, by, I like by, that. I like that. And I love how, too, it wasn't just about the exercise itself. This is how I, I'm really appreciative of your expertise as a teacher. But you were taking, you know, social skills lessons from it as well of, you know, the the kinds of things that do stop you in your tracks when you're a kid, when you, you, you know, you blurt out the answer and you get in trouble or you forget to take turns or to share or you're wrong and you're embarrassed about being wrong. All of those things that as an, well, actually, you know, it can still stop you in your tracks when you're an adult. Too, can't they? <laughs> Absolutely, it stops us in our tracks as adults, mm. and we just assume as adults, like as we as we experience more these things, these games, we wouldn't really care about um, yeah. getting it wrong now. But as a child, if that's mm-hmm. their first experience doing that, and they're and they are shy and they don't want to get things wrong, it's a it's a really good opportunity for mm-hmm. teaching and children to fail and try again and it's okay to get things wrong and have those conversations so and doing it in a fun way that they can then feed that into other more serious situations I think that's great I mean the amount of tears that I have to deal with when I've when when I have I mean right now I'm not working so much with the younger kids I work with older kids but certainly in my years of teaching I had to deal with a lot of tears because mm-hmm. people are embarrassed because they've got these sorts of things wrong and uh, it seems so small, but it's, it's, it isn't when, that, no, when you're that, when you're you're right. And and learning skills. I mean, I, I talk about this on the yoga mat all the time, learning skills in a place where it doesn't really matter. Nobody minds if you can stay in tree pose or not. Nobody cares. They're not even watching you. If you can learn the skills in low stakes situations, that skill set is much more familiar when the stakes are higher. And yeah, we, yeah. we talk about that with adults all the time. Of course, why not with kids too? That's a great one. Yeah. I like it. Um, So the next one is also for younger sort of primary school or I think in the US maybe that's like elementary age. Um, So it's, I would say this one's for between four to nine years old. Mm -hmm. Um, Again, depending on the maturity, you could certainly do it with older kids as well and maybe younger. Um, And it's called Supermarket List. Again, maybe a very familiar one um, for us all, if we can recall back to our our own childhoods. Um, But this one is you need at least two or more people. And the idea is that one person starts and they say, I went to the supermarket and I bought. And they say an item beginning with a letter of the alphabet starting with A and going through. So I went to the supermarket, I bought apples. The next person says... I went to the supermarket, I bought apples and a banana. And you have to go through. Mm -hmm. And to begin with, it's easy because you're just remembering a couple of items. But then as you progress through, they're having to remember more and more. And so it's a a really good exercise for listening. And I'm also thinking about, this is really triggering my anxiety because I'm like, there are definitely (laughs) some letters in the middle of the alphabet that I have to sing the song to remember which one comes next. A hundred percent, me too. L, M, N, O, no. (laughs) (laughs) So it's good for for practicing the alphabet for all of us. Absolutely. (laughs) Um, It's... Also good for listening, for concentration, Mm. for memory. Um, Again, fun, 
fun while making mistakes, Mm -hmm. getting the lessons wrong. We've all been there um, in the wrong order, trying again. Um, So that sort of, again, just going around that conversation of, you know, failing, but it's okay. Yeah. And this one feels to me like it could be more collaborative because you can't succeed unless you've paid just as much attention to the things the other people are adding to the list as the things that you're adding to the list. So you do really need to be present and engaged, not just in your own learning process, but in the contributions other people are making to it. Yeah, Yeah. so Mm -hmm. it's that that, like collaborative work, that teamwork, which also really helpful for mm-hmm. then going back into school if you know you've got children who maybe they don't have lots of siblings or they haven't been seeing lots of friends mm-hmm. and so getting them back into communicating with others and connecting and listening and it's it's really helpful mm, um, I love that fun and taking turns yeah. I think that's a simple one but my <laughs> goodness that is a skill that needs to be practiced believe it or not no, I um, totally believe it. And it's a great car journey one. Oh as yes. Well. Yeah. So if you've got if you're coming back from somewhere on the mm-hmm. aeroplane or wherever you've been, it's a good time filler. Yeah. So I that that's a good one for parents or Fine. parents. Um, so then going into more mindful practices. So practicing for this is really getting more in line with with yoga mm-hmm. um so the first one is an absolute go-to for me it's called safari walk mm-hmm. and it's you're going to be doing this in 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 a group or you can do this one one to one um with children i would say really three upwards mm-hmm. um and it could go, I'd say, up to a, up to 11 as well. So, we're again, working within that sort of primary school age. And the this one is um, good for building mindful awareness, tuning children into their senses, mm. um, talking about, you know, what you can see, what you can smell, what you can hear, what you can feel, what you can um, taste, although they're mm. not going to be tasting so much in this one. Um, but also getting children out into nature, um, which is, you know, we know there's a lot of research to support, you know, along with with the practice of mindfulness, there's a lot of research to support the benefits of just getting outside and into nature for calming mm. the nervous system and relaxing. So even having that conversation with with children as well, um, reminding them that, that it can be something that they do to help them to feel calm. Mm. Um so this is something so, you're doing, you know, out and about, even if it's in your back garden or your front garden or, you know, a, a nature exactly. strip or a park or wherever you can get to where there are some aspects of nature to tune into. Going into a garden, a park, mm-hmm. and um, what you do is just have a conversation to begin with just to say to the children or the child what you're going to do. We're going to be going outside and we're going on a safari walk. We're going to see how 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 many butterflies, birds, creepy crawlies we can find. I'm just thinking this works well in the UK, but I'm imagining maybe Don't do Australia. this in Australia. <laughs> I just do this with, I don't have the same risk. I've not needed the same risk assessment. Maybe there's a real risk assessment that needs to go with this for, for people over your side. But you can still do this in yeah, Australia. Australia. You know, you're not going to touch the snakes and the spiders, but it's still it's still good practice to become aware of them. That's for sure. <laughs> Be aware of them. Maybe name them. Maybe name their potential. Um, <laughs> UK UK doesn't come with the same risk assessment. Um, but you're just you know talking about you know seeing how much you can find and so reminding the the children that they need to walk carefully they need to be quiet they need to really Mm. listen Mm. um they're using their eyes um just to see what they can find and if you come up with a scenario and we get this in the you know depending on where you are where you know perhaps you're not seeing that much that, that many creepy crawlies or birds or butterflies or whatever I live in London it can be limited um when I did this with the children at my school in in Tottenham it wasn't 
there wasn't so many exciting things to see. Um, so I adapted the game and said, okay, who can find me um, a yellow flower or who mm-hmm. can find me a brown crispy leaf and so you can you can adapt it depending on where you are as well um and really just with this one it's about the children child getting immersed into nature looking to mm. see what they can see what they can and, and enjoying enjoying nature nature and appreciating it and getting outside mm. um yeah. And I love how that kind of contrasts with the first couple, which were very kind of laser focused, take your attention, put it really specifically in one place, you know, remember details of that so that you can repeat them afterwards. And those are skills we use a lot at school. So there is a real value to that pointed conversation, as well as all of the social skills that you talked about, about remembering to take turns and paying attention to other people as well. And dealing with failure and dealing with success gracefully too all that stuff whereas this one is less about all of those skills it's a much freer and Mm. if you have a group of children you know they might just end up sort of running around and getting really excited and that's really good (laughs) you know you want to do that so it's just providing that little bit of structure for them Mm. to then explore and enjoy nature Um, And I do think this kind of broad, open curiosity is also required at some times in school too. Like it isn't every subject that asks you to really narrow in and and memorize and repeat. Some subjects do require you to kind of take a step back and look more broadly and to kind of notice relationships and patterns and details in that really open way. And, And even if it's just for that, there's benefit, but also, you know, give your brain a break from the really narrow focus and broaden it back out again and yeah Yeah. remember how it feels just to be gently interested and to be kind of looking for a range of different things and to be related to your body again so I love this for balance and I think I can definitely see how it's tiptoeing closer to the kinds of yoga practices that that I'm familiar with as an adult too Mm. yeah you're just sort of um introducing the idea of of mindful awareness to the children which Mm -hmm. you know is of course you know really helpful and this idea of the the benefits of of being out in nature and you can have those conversations with the children as well about Mm. introducing them even saying what the word mindfulness is and the different senses and getting them to experience those it's you know it's going to be helpful and how it can help them to feel calm. And we'll, I'll be coming to more um, things just now about articulating emotions, but having the conversations with the children, if they are feeling nervous, if they are feeling more overwhelmed, if they're struggling to concentrate, mm. then actually tune into your senses. What can you see around you? And, you know, remind, teaching them that that can help them to feel feel calm and then and then they can go back to the other activities in school that are requiring them to to really concentrate and focus exactly and do you notice that their energy is different after this more outside rambling nature kind of experience are they different in their energy after this can they kind of notice oh I feel different now to how I felt when we walked out the door yeah I think um that they're okay there's a version of this activity where they can just end up getting really wild and excited because they're outside <laughs> like my partner like, as a child yeah okay I can imagine him just running completely like, amok um but um yes yeah, certainly you if if they're doing this activity um and sort of really following it and taking their mm. time and being careful mm. um listening and certainly asking them afterwards how they're feeling they would definitely from my experience be able to say that they're feeling a lot calmer and relaxed Mm. and all the things that we would expect yeah I think Uh, even if you are the kid who is completely going crazy you're still going to have created an outlet for your energy that will allow you to be more calm and focused afterwards whether you feel it immediately or not that obviously needed to get out that energy needed event somewhere yeah, and it, it found it one. That opportunity as well it's important <laughs> i like it um, 
So the next one is also about mindfulness. And mm. this is a classic one. I've actually shared this one before in something on yoga medicine. I think it was just on the social, on um, the Instagram account. Mm -hmm. I did like a story or something once. Um, and it's called the Mindful Malteser. Mm. And so this one is really teaching um, children about the different senses. So you're talking about what you can smell, what you can see, what you can taste, what you can touch. And Training so for some it, delayed gratification as well. Oh my goodness. She's, she's brought reason. props. Watch this one on Instagram, people. I mean, on the, on the YouTube, she's brought props. I've got some more props <laughs> so you can hear them. So chocolate Maltesers. There is a version where you use a raisin instead. Now, boring, boring. I I haven't had the same. <laughs> I mean, I like raisins. I haven't been so interested in doing it. I'm not sure why. I, I can't see why not. Um, but basically, uh, the the Malteser. The idea is that they just hold this chocolate Malteser. For anyone who doesn't know what a Malteser is, it's got this. It's like a, a bubbly center. Um, malt, malt, malt center, center. malt, mm -hmm. bubbly center, um, <laughs> and then chocolates on the outside. And so you're just asking the children to hold it in their hands, look at it, to explore, to see all the different details. I mean, it just looks like a brown circle, but actually, if you look carefully, if, <laughs> if you look carefully, there are some little dents and things that you can tune the, the kids' attention into. And then smelling. Obviously, it smells like chocolate. So that's, you know, getting their, their mouth watering. Um, you can't really hear much, but you can always get them to, to see. To, right. to can you hear the ocean? Yeah. If they can, a little bit like putting a shell up to the end. And then obviously going into the feel. So how does it feel? Obviously, it might be starting to melt a little bit. So this is just getting them to take their time mm. and to appreciate the different the the different sensations that they get from from the Malteser. And then obviously the moment that they all have been waiting for, the taste, but they put it in their mouth and they're not allowed to bite it. They have to just see if they can let it melt. And oh. so that's... This would be a good opportunity for me to practice failure. That would be very challenging for me. <laughs> but yeah, yeah you, this is this is exactly the kind of... How yes, quietly no. everyone's listening for the crunch. No, I love that. And I think it it again mimics the sort of stuff that I talk about on the yoga mat all the time. Like instead of just going through the motions, this is something that kids would normally just pop into their mouths and, and crunch and eat without thinking too much about other than just yum, next, yum, next. Can you yeah. not just go through the motions? Can you make the experience kind of slower and more curious and more exploratory? And what do you notice when you take your time? And what happens when you take each part of the phase really slowly? This is, again, the, the kind of stuff I talk about in teaching pretty much every yeah. class. And I think that, that having that conversation to begin with and saying, you know, at the end, we're going to be having a conversation to, and to, we're going to be discussing how this makes us feel. Mm -hmm. So just kind of preempting that conversation for them as well. So they, they can prepare, you yeah. know, make sure that they're listening, tuning into the different senses as well. So then they, they, they're able to share how it makes them feel at the end and how it compares to, Maybe you do, you know, you could just let them eat one quickly as well. And mm. how does one make them feel? How does the other make them feel? And again, it's just getting children to tune into their emotions mm. and that mindful awareness, which is such an integral part of the yoga practice. Mm. And again, having a conversation with the children that, well, actually, this is this is mindfulness. This is how we're, le we're learning our different, you know, about the different senses. This is a practice of mindfulness. And you, if you're ever feeling nervous or anxious at school, like this is a skill, this is something that you can come to. I'm not mm. necessarily saying that, you know, they're going to have a pack of Maltesers in their pocket at school. They might get in trouble for that, but um, get, get, tune in, get, get, 
having the conversations, then they realise like, oh, this is this is mindfulness because it is a bit of a buzzword in schools as well. It's thrown around quite a lot. So they've heard mm. it and they just yeah. don't necessarily know what it means in yeah. terms of their kinds of experiences. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. And so it, it is certainly in, in all the schools I've been working in, it's a buzzword and they don't really know what it means. And so doing mm. these sorts of activities help them to learn what it is. Um, and then once they've learnt it in this very practical way, they can then apply it. And I imagine others. like yoga practices too, there'd be a couple of students who are like, well, I felt bored or I felt frustrated and I just wanted to eat the Malteser. Oh, okay, people have different experiences, but there'd be other children who I enjoyed it a lot more when I took my time and the process felt much more interesting and engaging and involving to me. And I felt calmer when I was immersed in that experience. So again, space for different people to have different experiences and to notice that their experiences aren't automatically the same, that might be helpful too. And also the idea that they're actually whether whether they enjoyed it or whether they didn't whether you know all of the time you're having a conversation about how it how it makes them feel yeah and that really is that you know that that leads quite you know nicely onto these other ones because it's getting children to notice how they feel yeah so that they can then manage yeah how they feel I mean that's step one isn't it you can't regulate your internal state if you don't know what your internal state is yeah and mm-hmm. so having doing all of these games, if you're then having a conversation after each one and just ha- having a conversation about how it makes you feel, mm-hmm. you're just broadening that child's vocabulary. Yeah. Uh, how they're, they're, they're able, their ability to articulate their experience, mm-hmm. which, again, even as adults, we struggle with, right? Finding the words. Totally, totally. And certainly with children, that's definitely the case. Mm. Um, So this leads on to another practical exercise, and I've got a prop for those of you. Back onto (laughs) YouTube, people. Back onto YouTube. And so this is a fun one to do with kids. It's a cup. (laughs) It's two cups, in fact. I've got two cups. Okay, I'm going to describe this. This is my description description skills. So this is, firstly, it's called, um, this is about articulating emotions. And I would say this is for, again, it's for younger children. Um, but again, depending on the maturity, you could be doing it for younger, younger um, older ones as well. But I would say probably between four and 10 years old. I've got two paper cups. Um, one cup I have cut a square out of. So if you are with younger kids, then they will, or even older ones, I actually struggled doing that. Um, it will just, <laughs> you know, take care. And then on top of the square, I've made this, I've made this sort of window, cut up window, and it says, how do I feel? And then with the cup underneath that I I, I put the other cup on top. I've drawn a series of different emoji faces. So I've got a smiling face. I've got an angry face. I've got a sad face, a scared face, a sort of anxious face. And it's the process of making this with children is really helpful because, again, it's just getting them to talk about their emotions. Mm-hmm. How, what emotions they've experienced previously, how it makes them feel, how it looks. So you could even start off, I mean, I use just emojis as, you know, because that always kind of is quite entertaining because kids tend to like them. And so just pointing at the different emojis and saying, well, what what feeling is this one? What's mm. this emotion? What's this emotion? And, and just building their vocabulary. So then when it comes to them experiencing the, it themselves, they can articulate it, mm-hmm. which is a big, it's half of the battle. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, then recognizing, so through all the mindfulness activities that, you know, perhaps you do with your kids, then building up the vocabulary so then they can articulate their feelings and then go on to then managing them if they are, you know, challenging ones like feeling stressed or sad mm-hmm. or angry. And what I love about the sort of hidden message of this one is these nested cups 
they're designed to show that feelings change. And so the sort of subliminal message is, you know, how do I feel today? I'm going to feel different later. I'm going to feel different tomorrow. It sort of communicates the the transitory nature of feelings and how they're they're going to ebb and flow and you won't be this way forever and different feelings will come up. And and that I think is also really important for kids to to learn and understand because your perception of time is so different when you're little and things feel like forever that, you know, yeah. won't be a big deal tomorrow or in a week and learning that I think could be hugely helpful. And yeah, and I think also learning that all of the emotions are allowed they're mm-hmm. all okay, mm-hmm. you know, and they all are like like what you're saying. They come and then they go. But then when we are feeling the difficult ones, there are things that we can do to manage them as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and so this goes on to the next um, list of sort of exercises that I come up with that are more for managing, you know, if a, if a child, um, and we'll go on to with, teenagers as well but if a child is feeling stressed is feeling angry is feeling upset and they've recognized that they've arti- they're able to articulate it they can have these exercises that they can go to and these are really ones that they can have in their back pocket that they could use within within the school environment yeah and wherever outside yeah. in the place wherever they are at home um, but it's teaching them, teaching them ones that that they can they can do to help manage manage their emotions mm-hmm. and regulate the nervous system. Um, so the first one, I'm going to start with again working with the younger children because at, they need more modification as yeah. you start working with older children. Actually, the exercises are just looking much more like the ones that we do as adults. We reflected on that before we started recording, didn't we? I started when I was about 12. You started when you were a similar age. And and I don't remember anything being special or different or being particularly bored. I think I just took in as much as I was able to take in and didn't worry too much about whether it was for me or not. And I think, um, you know, we'll go on to talking about with old children, but really, you know, don't be afraid of, introducing them to the to the more sort of grown up versions of the mindfulness meditation breath work mm. because they'll really enjoy that you know mm-hmm. if you present it to them as like okay this is oh this is a bit more sort of what we do as adults but you know let's try this together as well and um, I mean, even if they don't enjoy it having that conversation afterwards where they're able to explain how they felt and what their response yeah. was. I mean, even that you didn't enjoy it. You felt a bit bored or it felt a bit frustrating. Great. You've learned yeah. how you felt. You've articulated it clearly. That's still a win as far as I'm concerned. Absolutely. Any opportunity where they're building up that um, sort of vocabulary and conversation about feelings is is certainly going to be helpful. Mm. Um, so I've got another prop for this first one. We love the so, props. So for this people, is starting to feel like a kids' TV show. You have to watch this one on YouTube. <laughs> it's a very, very glittery and gorgeous pinwheel. I'm excited for this one. So this is this is a pinwheel. Um, by the way, I bought this one on on Amazon. I don't know if, if you do you have Amazon. I, I know to- it. We don't have it, but I know it. You know of it, um, and I had to put it together. And it took me a while, certainly. (laughs) So definitely watch this one on YouTube. Humor her. Validate Uh, the effort that she put into this. I feel very proud of myself for this this pinwheel that I put together. Um, So this is called Pinwheel Breath, and it's for young kids, and it's really teaching them to extend the exhalation. Mm -hmm. So you can start, so to help regulate the nervous system if they're feeling anxious if they're feeling angry if they're feeling upset or if they're feeling even overexcited Mm -hmm. and they recognize that then they can come to their pinwheel breath and in order to teach it you can do it with the pinwheel 
But then once you've tried it a few times with the pinwheel, you can practice without the pinwheel and they can just imagine that they've got the pinwheel. So they're going to be taking an inhale through the nose and then exhale through the mouth. And they see that they can so do If you it don't know what a pinwheel is, it's like a little miniature windmill where it's like a flower petal that you blow into, it catches the wind and it turns. And it does, in a really practical way, teach you how to elongate your exhalation. So we've talked about a bunch of top-down, noticing feelings, regulating feelings, noticing thoughts, you know, categorizing sensory sensations and remembering them and retaining them. And now we're working on kind of bottom up, just working through the nervous system with all the tools that work for us as adults, which of course work for kids. I love that. Yeah. So pinwheel breath. I mean, really, this is about them just regulating once they've noticed how they're feeling and they're feeling upset they've got this tool in their back pocket and they can come to do it in their own time once they mm. once they've learned that with the pinwheel they don't have to have the pinwheel in their back pocket they can have their imaginary pinwheel mm. that they take to them and i love that conversation you say well you know if, if you are feeling upset or if you're feeling nervous like you can do the pinwheel breath you know um and it's it's a, it's you know they, it's it's a it's a tool in the back pocket mm-hmm. that um, children can learn really from a very very young age mm-hmm. and it's teaching them that really valuable lesson of just the power of the breath mm-hmm. and how we can calm the nervous system regulate how we're feeling simply through extending the exhalation mm. it can be really powerful for lots of people so I like that that's the first one. and that's a real go-to for when when I've worked with little children I mean mm-hmm. three years old they're able to be doing this um and it's really rewarding and and it's a nice it's a nice colorful one especially for the yeah. little ones I had a conversation with Dana on conscious parenting and she mentioned teaching her son Zaya to to blow in her face this would be my preference because I immediately went to a snotty place I'd seen a few too many snotty face kids recently and I was like no well, no I don't want anyone blowing in my face thank you the pinwheel Dana the pinwheel I'm I'm back on board with you belatedly yeah. now Pinwheel is is lovely and enticing and and you're right. It's very easy once you've got the technique of it. I think kids are familiar with using imagination. Once you've got the technique of it, you can take that imagination with you and use the practice, use the technique anywhere at school, you know, in sport, with your friends, whatever is the emotion producing moment for you. Yeah, I like that. It's simple, but it's fun simple this so yeah simple and fun and effective mm-hmm. yeah um so the next one is te- teddy bear breath now i don't have a teddy bear so Aww. i'm sorry about that. um i have no one help. not in this room though so that's no help for today we're just gonna have I to use our imaginations people I had my dog's teddy bear and i was like this has been chewed this is gonna give people nightmares <laughs> If, I, if no eyes, no nose, so 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 I don't have a teddy bear. So um, imagine a teddy bear that hasn't been chewed by a dog for for months at a time. Imagine a teddy bear, but I'm sure if you've got kids, whoever's listening to this, you, they can they'll they'll have plenty of teddy bears and toys. And mm-hmm. basically, this is one where it's diaphragmatic breathing breathing that you're teaching the children and or the child and. They're going to be placing their, holding onto their teddy bear or their toy, whatever Mm -hmm. it is, and just placing it on their belly. And as they breathe in, they're going to breathe into their belly and push the the teddy bear away as they do that. And then as they breathe out, the belly draws in and the teddy bear will come in as well. It's easier to do this if you're first teaching a child do this lying down when they're lying Mm -hmm. down on their back because they can really see the teddy bear rise and fall um but you can do it seated and anyway once they get the idea of it they they can 
do it standing. They can do it when they're sitting down in the classroom, mm -hmm. in their carpet space, at the table. They can do it in the car um, and pretend that they have their teddy bear again. So using just that imagination. But it's a good way for introducing it initially, mm -hmm. especially, and this is for little, this is, the little children really mind you um, though i mean i teach a version with adults where we do it with a yoga block or we do it with a hand or you know the one where you lie prone and we have a, a rolled up blanket or towel i mean it's pretty much the same without the connotations of something that you love resting on your belly it's still a technique that plenty of people need to learn so yeah Maybe we do say to our adult students they can bring their favourite teddy bear to class. Oh, week. I would love that. That would make me so happy. <laughs> no, I like that. And it's very similar to the last one in that once you've got the technique, and, and I agree with you, much easier lying down. Once you've got the technique, though, you can do it anywhere. So it's something kids could do, you know, secretly without drawing attention to themselves, just to have a hand on their stomach and to be breathing into their hand to kind of master their emotions in a whole range of scenarios that don't require them to have their teddy bear or be lying down. So again, giving them simple, effective skills in their back pocket that they can call on when they need them. I think that's awesome. Um, so the next one is called high five breath. And I really love this one. Um, I have we, also shared this technique for adults. So I guess I'm either a childish person or I'm teaching childish people or maybe a little bit of both. <laughs> yeah, we're, whether we're children, whether we're adults, the nervous system is the same, the breathing's still the same, and we all Pretty still much. benefit. Um, I just call it high five breath because... Kids love a high five. Um, I've called it the the five finger meditation, which makes it sound more formal. But it's the same thing. Right. It's the same thing, though, isn't it? This is a really special one because actually, in the school where I'm working, the school that I work in in Tottenham goes from nursery all the way up to A level. So it's from two years old up to eighteen years old. And in the wow. primary school, we actually do this at the end of break time. So once the children have had their break time, they've been running around, they've had a lot of fun, and then they're lining up ready to go back into the classroom, we do high five. And everyone is doing this together. And it's a and basically you're just they have their high five high five hand in the air. And with the other hand, with the first finger, they're just tracing round the thumb. As they inhale, they go up the thing, up the thumb. And then as they exhale, they go down. Inhale through the nose as they go up the finger and then exhale through through the nose as they go down. And they're just tracing the finger, inhaling as they trace the finger up and then exhale as they go back down. And it's five deep in-breaths in and out through the nose. Mm -hmm. um, and honestly, it th this is this is one where there's an instant palpable change. Of, and we've got a big school. It's a big mm -hmm. state school in Tottenham and it's after playtime. And it is amazing how they settle down the whole group, the whole school mm -hmm. um, doing this high five. And we're doing this from, so it's from recep the, the year one, so six years old up to 11 years old. And they all do it and they all love it. And that's the routine. And it just settles them yeah. before going back into the classroom. I mean, like I said, in fact, I can link to a class on Yoga Medicine Online where I've done this. For me, it's the combination of having a, a super simple structured uh, practice. You don't have to think it's dictated for you. That combination with the tactile contact of your sensitive fingertips on the soft skin of your hands. So it's the combo for me of top down and bottom up that really, for me, hits the sweet spot in terms of, you know, some meditation techniques are a little bit um esoteric sometimes this one is just super grounded and practical and there are definitely times in in adults and children's lives where that's what you need just simple practical tactile and you're taking five slow breaths and that can create this fundamental shift in your internal state it, yeah it's and it's quick mm -hmm. and so it's really easy to just fit into this is an example. It's just something really easy to fit into the day, into the mm -hmm. school routine, which is so jam-packed. Um, and it's one that 
certainly in my school that I work, now that's just a rec recognised breathing, meditation, mindfulness exercise that all the kids in the primary school do and know. Mm. And so it's their go-to if they're ever feeling, but it's their go-to, everyone, it's the routine after break time, everyone does it. So they're all doing it a couple of times a day anyway, but then they also will choose to do it in their own time as well. And it's not frowned upon, it's just recognized as, okay, this is what I'm doing. I just doing. need to change my state. Come. Yeah, I love that. Um, that's a favorite mm -hmm. for me. Yeah, me too. Um, and the next one I want to teach, and this is um, the humming bee breath. Mm -hmm. Again, so we're getting more we, familiar now. Yeah, so we're getting more familiar. Mm -hmm. um, this one, I call it humming humming bee breath because it's just a little bit more fun for, for children. Um, but really, it's exactly the same as the version that we have, uh, the Brahmari Pranayama meditation for adults. Um, and so with this one, blocking off the ears, covering the eyes as well, and two versions. So they can either hum or do a zzz sound. Mm. Um, so... The z sound is a little bit more. I tend to do that with the the smaller children, um, and then humming with the with the older children. Um, but really, you can mix it up. It's mm -hmm. it's no, it's no different. But it's again this idea of extending the exhalation, tuning in to what they can hear, um, like blocking off the senses as well, so then they can turn inwards um and another really good one for just resetting calming calming down so yeah i find that one really beneficial for myself yeah, and again well. this is something i teach to adults and use myself so yeah 100 yeah. percent that really quick shift in your internal state and again for me it's the combination of physical tactile grounded sensations with the mental intention you know, you, you're doing this to change your internal state, but you're also focused on the feelings and the sounds and the vibrations in your physical body. That combo for me is the kind of sweet spot. Maybe I am just a child. We're all in. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. Me too. <laughs> um, yeah, really the only difference is the name for these. Yeah. Exactly I mean, and I often use the English in, in classes as well, so. There you have it. Yeah, yeah no, I, I think that's yeah. awesome. Yeah, and but I think, yeah, just it's just educating kids on when when they can do it. Yeah. You know, when it's helpful to do this, because they might just be like, oh, okay, I'll give it a go. And they don't they don't associate it with, oh, if I'm feeling overexcited or if I'm feeling angry or if I'm feeling sad, they don't yeah. necessarily think, oh, I can do this. But I mean, they, they beginner to... yoga students don't always make that connection either. So I think as teachers of kids and as teachers of adults, it never hurts to make that connection for you. Like this is not just something that you can do on your mat. Once you've got mm -hmm. these tools in your toolkit, there are plenty of things you can pull out whenever you need them, whenever you yeah. need to become aware of your internal state or shift your internal state. And I mean, that's really the, the sort of journey you've taken us on today of starting off with being present, focusing, channeling your attention, noticing details, remembering them, repeating them, mm -hmm. plus all of the, the social skills of taking turns, letting other people speak, remembering what other people said, doing well and handling it, doing poorly and handling it, you know, all of those sorts of things that are really useful in school, really useful also in, in adult life, and then making your way through the, the softer, more curious mindfulness practices to what can I see, what can I smell, what can I hear, what can I taste, to how am I feeling, what is that feeling, how would I put words to that, how would I describe that, can I change that feeling, oh, I can by blowing on the pinwheel or breathing into my belly or humming on the breath or the high five grounding my mind in my body yeah I think there's a really lovely progression there that no and matter what you're that, dealing with will help yeah and I just think 
when working with children, just make like making that progression really clear to them, mm-hmm. articulate this is this is why we're doing the pinwheel breath. This is why so I'll often team doing the cup <laughs> the cup the feeling exercise. cup. The cup of feelings. Cup of feelings, we'll call it. The cup of feelings activity, which is very practical, getting them to talk about the activity. And then I'll team that with them learning different techniques for whether it's a breathing exercise, whether it's a, um, the humming breath or the pinwheel breath, whatever it is, but making it very clear to them, like, this mm. is why. Mm. You know, we have all these challenging feelings, And there are things that we can do about it. Mm -hmm. We can talk about it, firstly, recognise it, give it a name, and then we can do things to regulate it as well, the high-five breath or whatever it might be, and just making, really drilling it into kids that that's that's available to us because it's something that I wish I'd learned from a younger age. Mm. Um, And it's 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 not super complex but it's something that can really be life-changing for yeah. my experience has been. and I imagine the repetitions really helpful for kids as is for adults in the sense that you know we're not always ready to take things in the first time and so sometimes you got to wait for the aha moment where the piece of information lands with just the right receptive state of oh Oh, yeah. So you just keep planting seeds and you're hoping that eventually they'll take root and they'll grow. And and that's why we do share a, a variety of different ones. I'll teach a variety of different techniques to to the children that I work with and the teenagers mm-hmm. that I work with. Because they might like one, they might not like one. They, you know, they choose, they pick and choose the one that resonates with them. Um and having, you know, it's the same with me. I always do the same yeah. meditation exercises and breathing exercises. I've got my go-to. <laughs> yeah, me I, too. <laughs> in my own practice, I don't really have much variety, but I know it works, and so yeah. I go with it. No, so I it's love that. For children from a young age as well. Brilliant. Um, well, thank you, Alice. Is there anything else that you want to share before we kind of wrap up? I think that's everything. Brilliant. Oh, yeah. I think there are lots of techniques in there that no matter, you know, who we're talking to and, and where they're at, whether it's that that the kids really need to hone in on focus and concentration, whether it's more the feeling side, identifying feelings, whether it's more the regulation side, picking up tools to help them manage those feelings and make them a little bit more handleable in the moment plenty of tools and techniques for people to choose from that are just a little bit more engaging to younger minds and bodies than the ones that we're familiar with, right through to the ones that we are familiar with. So I love that. I really appreciate the the time and the props. Oh, thank you. I'm glad you appreciate the props. (laughs) So where would you send people who want to know more about you and what you do? And Well, I have my Instagram which is Alice Louise Yoga. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll, I'm on there now, more sort of every week I'm trying to post at the moment. And mm-hmm. so you can contact me through the direct messages there. Um, also on my web, website, which is alicelouiseyoga.com. And there's a part um, on my website, which is called the Yoga Project UK. Mm-hmm. And this is really everything that I do within schools. Um, So all the yoga, um, mindfulness, meditation, I've got some free classes on there as well for working, for teaching yoga to the different age groups. Um, So, yeah, if you're interested in working with children, working with teenagers and want some tips and advice on that, then that's the area of my website, The Yoga Project UK. Um, But it's, yeah, it's just part of alicelouiseyoga.com. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much for giving us so much of your time today. I really appreciate it. My pleasure, Rachel. Thank you for inviting me on. Thanks for listening to Yoga Medicine. If you liked the show, be sure to subscribe and leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you got something out of this episode, please spread the word and share it with a friend. You can find more information, articles, trainings, and classes at yogamedicine.com. 
Check us out on social media as Yoga Medicine, or you can email us at info at yogamedicine.com. Thank you for being part of our Yoga Medicine community. The content of this podcast is not medical advice and is not meant to replace medical care. Please consult your healthcare provider to determine what is best for your unique healthcare needs. 